We want to extend our congratulations to Jerry and Maggie Hornbuckle. They're not here this morning because they're celebrating as they celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. Jerry and Maggie are celebrating their anniversary by traveling to Kansas and Indiana starting yesterday and will finish on August 23rd. They have requested prayers for safe travel. Also, beginning August 30th, if everything continues to go well, we are returning to Sunday morning Bible classes for all ages, nursery through adult, beginning August 30th. Bible classes will begin at 9 a.m. with worship following at 10.30 a.m. We will continue uh, offering an online Bible, adult Bible class and worship service each Sunday morning for those not able to attend. In order to continue our efforts to maintain the safest environmental possibly, we are requesting your assistance in the following. You will find those seven requests listed in the online bulletin. Be sure and check that out, please. Are there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? Yes. Okay, back to school party next Saturday night at the beaches. Yes. Part, everybody. Everybody. Okay. Anything else? Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we're so grateful that even when times are like this, we're able to lean on you and know that everything is all right. Father, to know that you are in control. Father, we thank you for this time we can gather together as we lift our voices in songs of praise to you. We hope that you find it pleasing as it comes from our hearts. Father, as we remember the death of your son and all that you've done for us, in making us your children, we give you thanks. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Philip. This morning we'll, we'll worship by uh, reading a psalm together, part of a psalm, and then singing three songs that are based on various, various uh, passages of psalms and echoes of psalms and some direct quotes. And so I hope you're encouraged and blessed by our singing from... Uh, Psalm 103, from Psalm 81, from Psalm 3, and then following, uh, singing those songs, David Holland will lead us in prayer. Let's uh, stand together if it's convenient, and we will uh, read together from Psalm 95. Let's read together. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy hell and salvation. Oh, you Oh, man. 
Let's be seated, please, as we sing from Psalm 3. You are our shield. You are the lifter of our head. With, with a thought, you created everything we know. You, there is no God like you. There is no other God but you. We are here today to worship you and you alone. We are in awe of your creation. We see your reign. We see the change of the seasons, and we, we just cannot fathom how awesome, how infinite you are. We see that, we know that, we comprehend that, but we still fall short, we still sin, we still miss your mark every day. Uh, we, uh, we choose our own path instead of what you would have us do. You've said a narrow path and we choose our own way. But we are thankful now that you sent your son Jesus to give us hope for eternity with you we we can't meet your requirements but your son covered those sins for us we we thank you every day for that blessing right now uh, as we enter into this worship we uh, we bring before you those of our number who are sick who can't leave their house who can't leave the hospital Please nurse them back to help. Help us to reach out to them. Let them know that we miss them dearly. There are those that are number that, that won't come. 
that, that, that do not want to be here with us. Help us to reach out to them. Help us to be your hands and your feet to show them your love. Help us to show that love to the world right now in this time of disruption. So many people are searching. Help us to be the image of your son Jesus as we're called to be so that they may see you and come to know you. Please guide our hearts, our minds, our thoughts as we enter into this worship. Help us to pay attention to the words we're singing. Help us to listen as Gary brings the message. Help us, help us not to be empty vessels, whitewashed tombs. Help us to instead be pure inside and out. Help us to do your will every day. Forgive us when we sin. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Love is kind. Love is patient. <clears throat> love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love endures all things. God is love. For God so loved the world that he came, he gave his only begotten son, so whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. <clears throat> For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. These are some of the verses that we know and love. Um, we think about Jesus when he came down to the earth, and he did many things out of love for many people. And he did something for us out of love. And he went to that cross and died on that cross for us. So today, we gather around the table to remember when Jesus went to that cross and died for the love of us. I want to read a little bit out of Luke 22, starting with verse 14. And when the hour had come, he had reclined at the table, and the apostles said to him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat the, this Passover with you before I suffer. But before I say to you, I shall never again eat until this fulfilled with the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share this among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And when he <clears throat> took some bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after it he had eaten, saying, This is the cup which is poured out for you for the new covenant of my blood. Why did my Savior come to us?
Till Jesus comes, I'll sing his praise.
table, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, but man must ever ex must examine himself, and in doing so, he must eat of the bread and drink of the cup. As we say a prayer for each of these items, we shall take a moment to reflect on the bread and on the cup. So if you would pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you sent Jesus down to die on the cross for the remission of our sins. As we take this bread, remember that this is his body that was on that cross that died for us. May we take this in a way that is pleasing to you, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Furthermore, Jesus raised the cup, said, take drink, this is my blood, it's died in the remission of your sins. Pray with me, please. Father, as we take this fruit of the vine, let us do so in a manner that's pleasing to you, and just be thankful for the love that you have given us and the love you show us. And that Jesus went and died on that cross, and so we remember this time that he did that. And may we reflect on that and just remember that we have a chance in heaven with you one day. For we ask all this stuff in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to give an offering, there's been some baskets placed outside the foyer and in the fellowship hall if you'd like to donate to the church. Thank you. Once again, let's be standing. Let's be singing one song before our lesson this morning. When peace like a
familiar picture. Yeah, it's the same thing we've been talking about for the last three weeks. This uh, dinner that Jesus is invited to by the Pharisee. You say, preacher, we've already been there longer than Jesus was at that house. <laughs> That's true. I admit that. But I don't really apologize for it because I think these things that he says are extremely important to us. We want to finish up this uh, group of sermons, there's four sermons with today's lesson. You remember he was invited there by the Pharisee. The Pharisee has a question about Jesus washing his hands, and Jesus uh, pronounces three woes on the Pharisees. And then one of the lawyers answered him, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he says, woe to you lawyers also. And though and that's what we talked about last week. Kind of divided up into three different things. That they were hypocritically burdensome. That they were really accessories to the murder of the prophets. And that they had stolen the key to knowledge. Last week we looked at those first two. And I told you this week we wanted to finish out with looking at that last one. Stolen the key to knowledge. Here's what it says in verse 52 of Luke chapter 11. Woe to you lawyers. For you have taken away the key to knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. Stolen the key to knowledge, not by physically hiding Scripture, not by limiting access to Scripture, because, in fact, the lawyers and the Pharisees were the ones who were pushing the most for people to study, to memorize uh, Scripture, and then to study their rules that they had added to Scripture. The legalism that uh, they were displaying steals the key to spiritual understanding, to spiritual knowledge. It obscures the truth of what God wants of us. That's what legalism does, is with that fence that they had built around the law, they had actually obscured the law with all of those hundreds and hundreds and thousands even of rules and regulations that they had added to it. They had done that by faulty interpretation we talked about, Sabbath rest, focusing on honoring God, had degenerated into just an absolute quagmire of all those thousands of rules. They had done so by mistaken priorities. Things like Micah 6 and verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. We looked at several verses like that, several passages in the Old Testament that they just ignored completely or seemed to. So that was one of the things they did. They just missed their priorities. And then by unwarranted additions. And remember several times we've talked about this verse from Matthew 15 that Jesus says, In vain they do worship me, teaching us doctrines and commandments of men. That's what we've been focusing on for the last three weeks. What do we get from this study? Okay? This is the fourth week. What do we get from this? What can we gain from this study? We're sometimes amused at the nitpicking rules that were added by the lawyers. The one we talked about last week about spitting on the Sabbath, uh, that just gets me. That you can spit on rocky ground, but don't spit on dirt. 
because you spit on dirt, it may cause a rivulet, the rivulet may be a furrow, and the furrow may be plowing, and you may be guilty of working as a farmer on the Sabbath day. Just seems silly to us. Amazed, maybe, at how often they seem to miss that point that the Old Testament made about serving God from the heart. Maybe astonished at their hypocritical use of loopholes. And we read one of those loopholes last week, and it's just amazing that uh, what you could carry if you carried it somewhere other than the regular way. Just uh, astonished by that. But is that all we get? Do we look back at them and go, yeah, they really had it bad. Or maybe we make an application. And our application may sound something like this. Well, I know that there are some religious groups that make those kind of mistakes today. Just last week, I was reading about the uh, Amish in uh, Pennsylvania. I knew they didn't want their pictures taken, but I didn't realize that the dolls that they use for their children are faceless because they see that as a graven image from the Old Testament. That's creating a graven image so you don't put a face on the doll. And so we look at some of those things and say, yeah, there's some religious groups that make those mistakes today. Or maybe you even make the application this way. I know that splits in our own fellowship over things like one cup versus multiple cups for communion, over things like Sunday school or not Sunday school classes, because they made those kinds of mistakes. If that's where our thinking is, we really are missing the point of these four lessons. There's a danger if that's all that we see. Sometimes we need to look in the mirror. Sometimes we need to take a good, solid look in the mirror. This morning's lesson is titled, The Dangers of Legalism, from Luke chapter 11, verse 52. I'm going to define it, first of all. And I started to put up some 1921. A guy came up with a definition for it, but it just seemed overly long. I looked at some other definitions, and I'm finally just going to do it this way. It's a system that depends on doing certain deeds and engaging in certain conduct or behavior to achieve salvation by earning God's approval. That's kind of an overall definition of what legalism is. Now, it's misunderstood in a lot of instances. And the reason it's misunderstood is because people look at it and go, well, to keep from being a legalist, I don't want to do anything. No, that's not right. If we disregard God's commands to avoid being a legalist, that's nonsensical. That's absolutely nonsensical because it's very clear that Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 15 and verse 14. Or Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Goes on to say that God created those in advance for us to do. So to say it's called antinomianism, that, uh, hey, we just, uh, uh, we just don't want to do anything because that would be legalism. That, that's wrong. We need to keep God's commands. And then Paul addressed that very thing in Romans chapter 6, first couple of verses. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace will abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So don't misunderstand legalism. But legalism is also a paradox, I think, because generally no one believes he or she is a legalist. That's just one of the strange paradoxes of it. The most legalistic person you can find, the Pharisee or the lawyer or the modern-day Pharisee or the lawyer, does not believe that they are legalists. Also, legalists are not always hypocrites. Jesus condemned those in the first century as hypocrites, generally. And generally a lot are, but are often sincere and very dedicated. Here's the distinction. I have to do X, Y, or Z for God to love me. Versus I want to do X, Y, or Z, because God loved me and adopted me as his child. 
People, there's a huge difference in those two statements. If you are a parent with a teenager, there's a big difference if that teenager is doing something to try to get you to love him versus he knows you love him and he's doing it because he loves you. We know that on a human basis. It's the same way with our Heavenly Father. Well, I've got to do X, Y, or Z to get God to love me is legalism. I want to do X, Y, or Z because God loved me and still loves me and adopted me as his child. That's the distinction. There are dangers of legalism. I had seven to start with. I knew I wouldn't have time to do that. I tried to pare it down to five. We'll only take time really to go into depth on two of them. Three of them will pass through pretty quickly. But these dangers of legalism. Number one, it promotes outward conformity over inner transformation. And that's what we've really been talking about over the last three weeks, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It does that by conformity to the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. It does that by attention to details, not principles. It does that by attention to externals, neglecting the inner person. So that's an easy one because we've already talked about it in a lot of detail over the last three weeks. So one of the dangers is it promotes outward conformity over inner transformation. Number two, it turns a relationship of love into a religion of rules. Love God, love each other. Jesus said that was the key to the Old Testament. That's the key to the New Testament as well. Love God, love each other. John 13, he says, A new command I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In other words, the calling card of the church should be that people see that we love each other. That should be the calling card. But instead of focusing on love, the danger is tending to legislate where God has not legislated. We have a history of mistakenly declaring certain actions as sin. We've got a history of that where God hadn't spoken. That should make us real wary of being rule makers when God simply laid out a principle. All right, golf, give me some examples of that. I'm going to give you a few. Some of you young folks will be shocked by some of these. Some of you older folks are going to be, yep, I was there, been there and done that. Because I'm going to tell you some things that have happened since I have been a Christian. Okay? A few decades that I've been a Christian, these things have occurred. There's a picture of some ladies at church. See anything wrong about that? See anything different about that? Some of them are wearing slacks. When I first became a Christian, a woman was not to wear slacks, pants, pants suits, anything along that line. That was a violation of separation of men and women in the New Testament, and especially not in worship. I remember the first time that a lady had the audacity to, work into our, to walk into our place of worship wearing a pantsuit. We were wrong. 1964-65, finishing high school, getting ready to go to college. I don't know how many preachers, how many Bible teachers I heard stand up and say, that invasion from England of those, that long hair, that is a violation. It's a shame under 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It is effeminate and a sin under 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I heard it preached. I'm telling you, I heard it preached. Any kind of dancing, any kind of dancing, absolutely lasciviousness. Forbidden. You can't do that. Not any kind at all. 
And of the last dozen weddings that I've been to, probably at least half of them, there was some dancing that went on. Father, daughter, mother, son. I didn't see any lasciviousness whatsoever. We were wrong. I love this one. I grew up in the hills, okay? A long way from the water. Men and women, boys and girls, could not go swimming together. It was called mixed bathing. And when I met my wife-to-be, who grew up part of the time in high school in Orlando, Florida, in Melbourne, Florida, her youth group had beach parties. The farther you got away from the beach, the more sinful it was to go swimming. I'm telling you. We were wrong. Conversely, on the other end of the spectrum, we also have a history of mistakenly declaring certain actions as being righteous, not sinful. I'm going to go farther back than my history in the church. I'm going to go back to a history that I've studied concerning our fellowship. I've looked at it quite a bit from about 170 years ago, 200 years ago. The example is this. Members of our fellowship argued for decades that the Old Testament sanctioned Slavery. Read the book, 12 Years a Slave. Look at the movie, 12 Years a Slave. It's got one scene that shouldn't be in there, but it's still worth your time. That man was captured from, I think, Boston, taken south and sold as a slave. There's a scene in that where they're worshiping where that the plantation owner is conducting an outdoor service while in the background one of the slaves is hanging up after they've been whipped. History tells us that that slave owner and his family were part connected with our fellowship. Some, including the president of one of the colleges associated with our fellowship, said that the curse of Canaan, that's one of Noah's grandsons, stipulated that blacks were ordained by God to be slaves. He preached it all over the country. Genesis 9 and verse 25 is where he gets that, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. Members of our fellowship argued that Jesus and the New Testament writers endorsed slavery as a natural order of things. There's your name, Alexander Campbell. Famous, excellent Bible scholar in most respects. He argued that slavery was not condemned by the Bible, only wrong as it was practiced in the U.S., They were wrong. They were wrong. If you read Philemon and other passages, it shows that while dealing with slavery as a part of the culture of that time, they sowed the seeds for emancipation. For there to be no slavery. The fact that we have been wrong in our rulemaking ought to make us see the danger. Not only is it legalistic to turn Christianity into a religion of rules, we're not very good rule makers. Thirdly, danger of legalism is it devalues the cross of Christ and the grace of God. I hope you were listening to that last song before the sermon. That second verse, ah, it just gets me. If God's approval can be earned by good behavior, grace 
is unnecessary. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. For, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Verses 2 through 4, and, or 4 and 5 and 8 and 9 of Ephesians chapter 2. Can't say it much plainer than that. If God's approval can be earned by good behavior, Jesus suffered needlessly on the cross. Galatians 2, Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If you can earn your way to heaven, if you can earn God's approval by doing good deeds, Jesus didn't need to die. Number four, it tends to promote tradition and status quo and opposes change. Why does it do that? I've, I've, I've thought about that a lot. I, I think this is where we are. We want to know what the text really says. Right? We want to know what the Bible says. That's called exegesis. We want to know how it should be explained and applied. That's called hermeneutics fancy words for those two ideas. The result, if we use the best, the best exegesis that we can use and use the best hermeneutic that we can find, the answer ought to be the right answer. The problem with that is once we have decided in our mind that we've got the best answer, the right answer, it's real hard to reconsider that answer. Really hard to even to reconsider where we are. But if I'm growing as I should, if I'm growing as a Christian as I should, to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, as Paul says in Colossians 1 verse 19, I should be, I've got the wrong thing up there. Not I should be willing. I should want. I should desire to examine and re-examine God's word as I grow in faith. Example. This is going to be hard for some of us. I'm telling you it's going to be hard for some of us. I first ran across this when I was teaching Ephesians in the auditorium adult class several years ago. And I put it out then as a possibility as maybe an alternate way of looking at things. Since that time, I've returned to it several times and tried to study it, try to research it, try to go back and see what other folks have said in the past and what people are saying now. And I'm going to bring it up to you again. I've never done it in a sermon. Caveat. I am not. Listen to me. I am not advocating any change in our corporate worship. I am not advocating any change. I believe our corporate worship is properly within the principles of New Testament worship and consistent with the historical record of the first century. So don't get me wrong. I'm not up here arguing for change. What I am asking, what I am asking for is a careful and cautious reconsideration of how we advocate our position, how we argue our position. I am asking if we could have been guilty of overreading. Remember, we talked about reading the hound out of something, okay? Overreading something or taking something out of context. The verse I'm going to address is Ephesians 5, verse 19, real familiar. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. One of our well-known proof texts that we in this fellowship have used for generations. How do we apply it? We apply it this way. That music in corporate worship is limited exclusively to a cappella congregational singing. That's the application we've made of that verse. 
Again, remember what I said. I'm not advocating any change. Just how we look at things. Look at the context, okay? I invite you, no, I, I ask you, I beg you, when you get home today, take Ephesians chapter 5 and read it in its entirety twice, three times. Sit down and try to understand what it's talking about. Verse 1, we need to imitate God. Verse 2, we need to walk in love. Verse 3 and verse 5, don't be sexually immoral. Verse 4, use clean speech, give thanks. Verse 6, don't be deceived by empty words. Verse 7, don't partner with disobedience. Verses 8 and 9, walk as children of light. Verse 10, discern what pleases God. Verses 11 through 14, expose works of darkness. Verse 15, be careful how you live. Verse 16, use time wisely. Verse 17, understand God's will. Verse 18, don't be drunk, don't be filled with wine, be spirit-filled. Verse 20, give thanks always. Verse 21, submit to one another. All those admonitions are on how to live our daily life. It's talking about our life, our walk, how we're to live on a day-to-day -day basis. Verses 22 through 33, the rest of the chapter, is daily relationship between husband and wife in marriage. Do you see a pattern there? Verses 1 through 18 in verses 20 through 33, all are focused on daily living. But we pull verse 19 out of that context and have argued that that applies to our corporate worship. That it applies only to corporate worship and cannot apply to daily life and that it established an exclusive pattern for corporate worship. Do you get that? We've got an entire chapter about living our daily life, and out of that we pull one verse and say, it cannot apply to daily life. It only applies to our time together when we're worshiping. Here's what it says in context. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. One thought. One thought. In fact, if you look at it, Paul says, here's what a spirit-filled life looks like. And he does it with five participles. A list of five participles. Addressing, singing, making, giving, and submitting. Some conservative commentaries, including Kaufman, and to some extent Weed, Divide Paul's list and say the first three participles in verse 19 apply only to corporate worship and the other two along with the rest of the chapter applies to our daily life. People, to me, it's problematic to say that the entire surrounding chapter and the entire immediate thought applies to daily life, but verse 19 cannot apply to daily life. That's problematic. Question, is there an alternate meaning that's perhaps more consistent with the context? In my opinion, my opinion, in context, Verses 9 through 19 through 21 contrast the debauchery of a drunk filled with wine. You've been about around a drunk filled with wine? What are they saying? What are they cussing about? What are they angry about? What are they singing? 
99 beers, bottles of beer on the wall, 99 bottles of beer. Okay? That's what a drunk filled with wine is doing. The contrast is what a spirit-filled life should look like and sound like. It exemplifies a person filled with the spirit. Does that mean that everything spoken has to be a psalm, hymn, a spiritual psalm? No. No. That's not what it's saying. Similar verse. James 5, verse 13. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing a psalm. Well, now, that means it's, it's an absolute pattern. And so anytime you're happy, the only thing you can do when you're happy is sing a psalm. Is that what James is saying? No, he's making a contrast, a generality. In context, to me, verse 19 is talking about our daily life, just like the rest of the thought and the rest of the chapter. It's a comparison between what a drunk would act like filled with wine and what a Christian should act like filled with the Spirit. Has zero to do with corporate worship except that daily life includes corporate worship. And so the entire chapter about submitting to one another, about clean speech, about pointing out works of darkness, all of it applies to corporate worship as well as daily worship. But it's not setting an absolute pattern for corporate worship and not applying to daily life. Again, I'm not saying change what we do. I'm fine with what we do. I'm just asking. If our traditional practice may have led us to overread Ephesians 5.19 or take it out of context. I'll leave that for your further study. Number five, it tends to turn adherence, legalism, tends to turn adherence into self-appointed Spec inspectors. Of course, I'm taking that from Matthew 7 and verse 3 from the Sermon on the Mount. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Remember the paradox. Legalists are often blind to their own legalism. Pharisees and lawyers were blinded as they repeatedly condemned Jesus for not obeying their own rules. Here's the problem. If I'm convinced that I have come to the correct, exclusive answer for how to act and how to worship, it's tempting to become overly judgmental. It just really is. It's part and parcel of the same problem. Think about this. If a behavior is within the biblical principle of godliness and practice with a sincere heart, I think God's pleased. If a behavior is arguably within biblical practice, like you ladies wearing pantsuit to church this morning, but I condemn it as sinful because it differs from my practice, isn't that legislating where God has not legislated or if an act of corporate worship is within the parameters of the worship principle in the New Testament and emanates from the heart it's what God wants if an act of corporate worship is arguably within those parameters but different from the way I do it and I preach that my practice is exclusively the correct practice isn't that that log of legalism sticking out of my eye? Folks, Christianity is a journey of faith. You may be wondering why in the world golf has spent four sermons on this little dinner party at the end of Luke chapter 11. A couple of things come to mind. 
One, as I'll tell you that I was raised in what very well could be the most conservative branch of our fellowship. That background makes me look at these things a little harder. The second thing is thinking about what I have done for the last 50 years. I was a high school principal. Okay? Rules and obeying rules part of my existence then. I've been a lawyer and a prosecutor. What's a lawyer? A legalist. That's laws and obeying laws. A prosecutor. It's so much a part of my DNA that when George is late coming up here to do the announcements, I'm ready to give out a tartar slip. Still, I haven't been a principal in 40 years. And if I am going somewhere and I'm not 10 minutes early, I'm late. That's just part of me. So because of those things on a journey of faith, my background and my DNA is such that I have to look in that mirror constantly because I want to be so much of a rule maker and a rule keeper and making sure I'm going to get God's approval by doing this, that, or the other. As we grow in faith, we may find that our previous understanding or use of a particular scripture was questionable. What do we do at that point? Do we say, if it's good enough for Grandpa, it's good enough for me? If we say, if it's good enough 10 years ago, it's good enough now. I think we're wrong. Our goal should be to rightly handle the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. We need to desire to do that every day. I've given you some things to think about and I'll tell you, I may be absolutely wrong on some of these. I invite you to visit with me. Let's talk about it. But I also wanted to give this as an example of how we need to rethink at times what we're doing and why we're doing it to make sure that we're walking as closely as we can. That's what God wants us to do. My plan next week is to have an 18-minute sermon to make up for these long ones, okay? <laughs> if you're not a Christian, we are going to offer an invitation song. And we invite you this morning to become a Christian if you have not become a Christian. Or if there's something in your life that you need the prayers of this congregation, we invite you to bring that to us as well. We'll pray with you and for you. Whatever you need, won't you come as we stand and sing? My hope is that Jesus
sent out an email I failed to get in the bulletin was the uh, back to school party this next Saturday at the Beaches House at 6 p.m. Uh, I'll send out a reminder as well but uh, food and drink we provided bring chairs to sit and if you plan on getting wet you better bring a towel okay all right let's pray Heavenly Father we are so blessed as a people we're so thankful for the ways that you watch after us the your word that you give us to study and to do our very best to follow your will in all that we do each and every day. Lord, we ask that uh, you continue to keep us safe and that uh, you bring a quick end to this uh, virus issue that's affecting our country, that you would open our eyes to those around us and that we would continue to do our very best to treat one another as you've asked us and commanded us to, with love for uh, them as we love ourselves and because you love us. Um, help us to not get bogged down in the things that this world is trying to tell us or the things that we uh, may believe from the past and that we do our very best to study your word and to follow you each step that we're upon this earth. Help us to continue to see about one another and that you would uh, give us the wisdom in all the decisions that we make. We ask for uh, your wisdom as, as elders of this congregation that we would always have uh, the best interests of the souls of the folks that attend with us here that are part of this family in all that we do. Thank you again for your son and for his love and his sacrifice, which make salvation possible through him. In Jesus' name, amen.